Welcome to the Landmark Theater's Q&A podcast. In this podcast, you will hear discussion with writer-director Matt Ross from the film Captain Fantastic, moderated by actor Chris Messina, recorded at the Landmark in West L.A. This is an, uh, an amazing movie. I love this film so much. I've seen it several times, and every time I see it, I learn a little something more about parenting. Um, I want to ask you, uh, what, how did this, how did it come to you? What, what, where, where did it start from, and, and where did you get this idea? I was actually writing it while I was editing the last movie I did called 28 Hotel Rooms, starring this man. And um, I think it really just was, uh, for me, the genesis was just being a father. I have two kids, and as I was watching my friends have kids and either being inspired or appalled by their parenting, um, uh, or I think um, my wife and I, if you charitably, we were discussing, but probably fighting about our different uh, parenting beliefs. And I was really thinking about what my values were at, 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 at its core, what's really important to me, what do I want to pass on to my kids. You know, my daughter just turned 13, and, and I realized like, she's going to be in the house for five more years. And that just goes so quickly. And what do, you know, I mean, on some, on some primal level, we all want to protect our children and we want to prepare them to leave the nest but I also think you know we want to uh, help them not make the same mistakes we did and and I was also thinking a lot about um, being present with my kids you know it's so hard in our we all have phones and computers and we're always on these things and sometimes I think um, we're, we're just not present and, and uh, I was just thinking about well, what would it be like if you were able to, most people aren't because in most families, both people have to work just to survive. But I was thinking, what, what if you could give up all your you know, professional ambitions or creative ambitions and, and, and devote every waking moment to your children, what would that be like? So I think that was the beginning of it. I had a lot of questions and I put them into a story. Yeah. And we, when we did 28 Hotel Rooms, it was just Marin Ireland who played the, uh, yeah. the woman in the film myself. So this, this must have been a, a big, uh, uh, big job. I mean, how many days did you have to shoot this? Thirty-nine, which is a lot for an independent film. It's a lot. Partly that's because you know we have six kids in every scene, and um, because of child labor laws, which are a great thing, um, uh, but it also prevents you from having a full and actual day of work. You know, the, the youngest kids could only work so many hours, so we would have to shoot around them or schedule. It was a scheduling nightmare. So, yeah, it, it seems like a lot, but, you know, the, the truth is, as any filmmaker knows, anyone who's been in film, it's all, it's all time and money, and there's never enough of either. And um, so you're with kids, it's, it's really short. Yeah, and those performances are incredible, aren't they? Those, those... Oh, thank you. That's... Um, we had a, 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 a Jeannie McCarthy, who's a great casting director, cast the film, and again, that's just time. You know, we saw kids from all over the United States because, you know, because of the internet, we saw kids from everywhere, we, every English-speaking country, um, all over Great Britain and um, New Zealand and Australia and Canada and um, George Mackay, who's the oldest, who, who plays Bodavin, is English, and uh, Nicholas Hamilton, who plays Relian, is Australian, wow. and... Um, I made them speak with an American accent the moment they got to set. And uh, just like their characters, George, was act he had no problem with it. And uh, Nicholas fought me constantly. Yeah. yeah. And how'd you, how'd you get Vigo? How did that happen? I, I just, uh, I didn't really have anyone in mind when I was writing it. I think you just never know who's available. You, and you also never know who you have access to. And, and when it came time to, to go out with the, the script and see you know, who we could get. I, Vigo was my first choice and he read it and we met and had a really long conversation, like five hours about parenting. He's a father and, and about the script and then when his schedule was, when he could do it, we, uh, we did it. Yeah. He's, he's amazing in the yeah, film. He's a really great actor. Where did the title of the film come from? Yeah. The, the truth is that I gave it to my mother and she said, oh, the Elton John album that I played when you were a kid. And people of, you know, that are my mom's age know that. And I said, what, Elton John album? Because I honestly had no idea. So there's an album called Captain Fantastic and the Dirt Brown Cowboy, which honestly, I swear, I had no idea. Now, obviously, it was part of the album she played, and I, you know, I played her album, so it was there. It turns out it has nothing to do with this movie whatsoever. Um, 
If you read, if you read the lyrics of the song, it has nothing to do with it. So I, it was just, it was somewhere deep in my subconscious, and I just thought, you know, for me, the, the title asks a question, and I thought, I mean, I, you know, I like titles that are memorable and evocative, and for me, it was meaningful, and it, it sort of asks a question about, is he? And if so, how? And if not, why? I think. You know. What kind of conversations do you have post film with your kids about what mm. are they saying? You know, in, in, with relation to the film. Well, my daughter's 13, so um, she's seen the film and is, um, you know, I, I, I did what Vigo's character does. What do you think? That's good. Uh, can you be more specific? <laughs> it's good. Okay, what does that mean? I don't know, it's good. Dad, like, so I, I get that. Um, and I do my best, I keep asking until she wants to kill me. My son, who's nine, is just full of love, and he's seen it a thousand times, and he'll talk about it forever, and he, you know, I think he's just more open to it, and um, I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, they've seen it many times. They came with us to Sundance, and then we went to Cannes, and I got to take them, which was amazing. And You went um, to Cannes where he won Best Director. Thank you. That was truly the most shocking moment of my life. Um, and, uh, and such an honor. Um, yeah, it was incredible. So, yeah. The question was, since making the film, have my wife and I come to closer terms in parenting? The truth is, the real truth is, the great irony of my life is that I'm making a film for many months about trying to be a good parent. Meanwhile, my wife is raising my children in my absence, <laughs> um, and I'm being a terrible father. That's the truth. Uh, no, I mean, I think all the questions I had, I put into the script. And, 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 you know, there's so little time in a day, and I really try and show up every day and allow all the other artists, all the other actors, to contribute to this thing, that we've, the script that we've all agreed on doing. But I did, it didn't really change my views on parenting. I think, I always say the ending is meaning, for, at least for me, and the ending of the film was always the ending of the film, and for me, the journey, his journey, is the meaning of the movie, for me. And so that didn't really change. Uh, I, I learn a great deal about being a father from my wife, and I think she's a far better parent than I, and um, so I give credit where credit is due. Um, but, you know, I, I say we fight. The truth is um, we discuss, and, uh, and I always say that being a parent is an hourly recalibration, you know? Mm. You're constantly like, okay, let's try this. Okay, I suck. I'm going to try this now, and like, you know. The question was, uh, did I write the story knowing that it was going to be a film? Was it always a screenplay and not something else? Or was it just a story? Or was it just a story? I, I've written, um, when I first started writing, it was, it was, they were all screenplays. I've written some short fiction. I have a failed novel. But this was always a screenplay. Um, so, no, I, I always wanted to make it into a film. Yeah. Secret uh, favorite uh, moment in the film and why? I think that's hard to answer, but... Um, you know, there's certain times where you think, oh, wow, this might work, and, and I mean the whole movie. And when I, um, uh, Vigo, the first time I saw him do the, the part, because he doesn't, you know, he didn't audition, um, he was doing callbacks with George Mackay, I think, and George, George was in Rome on a family vacation, and he was Skyping his callback, and it was the first time I heard Vigo read, and I thought, oh my God, yes, this is gonna work. Because <laughs> I had never seen, and I, you know, I didn't know what he was gonna do, but anyway, so, that's leading to when we cast Trin Miller, who plays Leslie. Um, yeah, Trin, woo! Uh, is she here? Trin, are you here? Oh yeah, yes. she's so fantastic. Tr Trin lives in LA now, but she was, um, uh, at the time, she lived in Seattle, and she auditioned for, in the script, that the Leslie, the mother, had no lines. She, she just appeared uh, in a kind of a dream sequence. And she doesn't talk. I think I wrote something like, her mouth is moving, but no words come out. And it was just this kind of strange, evocative moment, I hoped, where he was thinking of his wife. And so she had said um, that she had read the script. And so I asked them to improvise. And I think it was like 3.30 in the morning. And we'd been shooting all day. And they did this long improvisation. And Trin made Vigo cry. And they were connecting. And I think my favorite moments probably were between them because it was so... Uh, surprising and real and authentic and it, I didn't make it happen, they made it happen, so I think.
the cinematography and the close-up shots and uh, the, the kind of the, the, the uh, vibe about that. Whether there was a, a, um, a metaphor, if there was a metaphor that uh, I was searching for by having close-ups. No, I, I, I wanted to shoot um, a handheld as opposed to locking the camera down because I wanted the, uh, I wanted to breathe breathe with the actors, and I wanted to feel messy and organic. And I mean, it's it's false because it's you know it's no more messy or, or or organic than if you, you know, lock the shots down. But it was something that Stefan Fontaine, who's the cinematographer, does really well. Um, if you guys have seen Rust and Bone or A Prophet or The Beat My Heart Skips, he's an amazing cinematographer. Yeah, he's a he's a master, and he's he's such a or he's such an organic storyteller with his camera, and he tends to shoot all all his work with Jacques Audiard tends to be handheld, and I just thought that it would allow us to breathe and move with the actors, and it wouldn't feel uh, presentational or feel you wouldn't feel it at arm's length with, with them. So that was the intention between for that. Yeah. Where did you do the amazing filming? So it was shot in, in the state of Washington and, and the state of New Mexico. So, yeah, Washington. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Really, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have been watching the Landmark Theater's Q&A podcast. For further in-depth discussions with filmmakers, be sure to check out the other Q&As available on our channel from past films. And remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all our bonus content. Thanks for watching.